It's Marcia Cork. You know I talk about having the confidence to rebrand and get visible on social media. Well, it's time for me to practice what I preach. Do me a favor before you start the show. Open Instagram and TikTok and follow me right now at It's Marcia Cork. You'll get additional tips you won't hear on the podcast, including a semi-weekly series I call You're Doing It Wrong. So follow me right now and meet me back here and let's start the show. Hello, hello, MCs. It's Marcia Cork, and welcome back to another episode of Ooh, Those Effing C Words. It's Friday, everybody, and I am happy to be back in the company of my MCs. I got a lot of great feedback on episodes 13 and 14. So, so far, you all are loving Mama Gar, <laughs> loving her Monday motivation. Mama Gar actually went viral this week, you guys. If you're not following me on Instagram, you missed it. But Mama Gar, Mama Gar's post, let's see, it got over 11,000 views and over 300 likes. So that's the Monday motivation that you would hear at the end of um, the episode. So I believe episode 11, episode 13, Mama Gar had her Monday motivation. And I've also been posting that to Instagram and um, across social media on my LinkedIn profiles, a few places. So people are loving it. And I knew that you would. That's why I was, I, that's why I, I talked her into doing this really, because she's been doing them by text and by email for years. Now, you know, I was saying that I knew it had been more than a decade since she was doing them, but she said it's been more than 20 something years that she'd been sending them to coworkers and then circulating them throughout the family and everything. So, you know, this was just my way of bringing her into what I'm doing with building confidence and public speaking and having her commit to doing this as well. And she jumped right in and the feedback has been great. So yeah, over 11,000 views on Instagram, over 300 likes. And that's a big deal on my little my little Instagram page. <laughs> you know, I'm just starting to get visible and active on Instagram. So Go ahead and follow me there. If you aren't already, you can find me at It's Marcia Cork, I-T-S, Marcia Cork, especially if you're enjoying Mama Gar's Monday Motivation on the podcast, because now that we're playing with this new format of not doing a Monday episode, then the place to get her Monday Motivation will be on Instagram. All right. So yeah, so follow me there. And we also have to talk about last Friday's guest. Tony Butler Sims. That was a great conversation. I've been getting great feedback on that episode as well. And you will be happy to know that he is willing to join us again. You know, he mentioned it at the end of the episode, but I have since talked to him and he's on board for doing it again. So I was actually thinking about maybe having Tony. I haven't asked him this yet. (laughs) So, so, um, uh, I guess I'm kind of putting them on the spot, but we'll see, you know, you know, people can be convinced, but I think it might be a good idea to do a Q and a with Tony, because that way you can send in your um, MC Q and a, and if it's job related, um, interview related, you know, those types of questions, maybe we can do a little, um, a little tag team and answer your questions together. So I'm going to throw that out at him and you guys let me know what you think about that. All right. Well, listen, this is the first time back after a little pause, not doing the Monday episode. So this is going to be a jam packed episode and I'm excited about it. As you can see from the title, we've got a lot to cover. I'm going to shake things up and actually lead the show with the MC Q&A, just because that's a bit of the format that we're used to, you know, to start the week off with some MC Q&A and then close out the week with the with, um, you know, more traditional conversation. So that's the format for this episode as well. We're going to jump into MC Q&A, and then I'm going to close out with a LinkedIn audit. This is a one-on-one session that I did recently, um, and I think it's a great flow for the conversations that we've been having for the past several weeks, all about 
building confidence as we navigate career pivots and explore entrepreneurship. You know, we've been talking about my It's Me approach. We've been talking about how to use the content from your It's Me approach to populate LinkedIn profiles, resumes, things like that. So you're going to see that come up in my conversation with Wendy. That's who I'm doing the LinkedIn audit with. Um, you're going to hear that come up in our conversation. So I think it's a good way to kind of close out this discussion where we've been talking a lot about change and confidence as it relates to the traditional job hunt and to entrepreneurship. But I want to also start having some some conversations around how change and confidence present themselves in relationships and in navigating difficult conversations. So we're going to add some more variety to these conversations on the podcast. All right. But this is a good way to, like I said, close out a lot of the conversations we've been having. So MC Q&A, and then we're going to close out with the LinkedIn audit. All right. So let's start the show right after this break. All right, guys, welcome back. So we are jumping into MC Q&A. Question one came by direct message, we'll call this listener Torn. And Torn says, okay, coach, (laughs) I need your help. I'm an educator and I've got former parents asking me to tutor their kids after school. I promised my husband and children that I wouldn't do after school tutoring so I could be available for my grandbabies, but I feel torn. So attached to my students, love what I do, extra cash is nice, Saying no is really hard work. I think I have FOMO. Now, when I read that, I thought that was fear of moving on. (laughs) So I had to Google it. And it is actually fear of missing out. But, you know, I think in this context, they're, they're probably both the same. And this is a great question. And I like it because it's kind of setting the tone for it. Like I said, navigating difficult conversations, which I definitely want to do more of on this show to add more conflict into the equation. So one thing is for sure, saying no is really hard work. And again, this is another one of those comfortable conversations we need to have. But in this question, I think the first thing is to identify what Torn really wants. So let's see. What do you want most? So there is the promise to your husband and children. So Is that where your priority is? Are you more concerned about breaking a promise that you made to your husband and to your children? Or is it more that you want to be available for your grandbabies and that, you know, working after school is going to impact that time? Or do you value more being there to support your students? So it's really about deciding first, what do you want most? to keep that promise to your husband and to your children, to be available for the grandbabies or to, you know, to continue to support your students, even though you made this promise. So I would say to first identify the thing that you value most and then build your conversations and the way that you approach um, the parties that you need to let down, who you, who you need to say no to, positioning yourself and how this benefits you just as much as how it benefits them. Because I can already hear how your decision benefits the other parties, right? We can see how it benefits her husband and children being available to them in the afternoons. We can see how it benefits the grandbabies being available to the grandbabies, right? Also keeping a promise to the family. And we see the benefit to the students the benefit to the parents, but I don't hear the benefit for yourself, right? That's the one thing that isn't communicated in this question. How does it benefit you? What do you get out of this? What do you value most? So that's the first thing to decide because if you're making the decision to be available to other people, but there's a longing to actually still do this kind of work, um, to you know, to continue to be available to the students, then I would lead with, like I said, positioning what you need as you approach your family, and not really giving them an opportunity to talk you out of it. So saying something like this: 
So I've made a decision to continue tutoring after school, but here's why. I know this impacts you, but ultimately it's the best decision for me. This is what's gonna leave me feeling fulfilled. And I know you care about me being fulfilled. So this type of statement, as you can hear, it really doesn't give them an opportunity to interject. It doesn't give people an opportunity to say, but you said, because you're saying, okay, I've made this decision and here's why. So you're jumping right into your explanation of how it's a need for you and how it benefits you. Because when you phrase it that way and you closed out with saying, this is something that's gonna bring me joy. This is something that's gonna leave me fulfilled. How can people oppose that, right? How can anyone oppose what you say brings you joy and leaves you feeling fulfilled without them being selfish or narcissistic, right? So that's a good way to approach difficult conversations is to communicate a need right up front, to communicate what you need and what you desire right up front. The hardest part about the difficult conversations is the fear <laughs> and the anxiety that we build for all of the days, weeks, and months leading up to this conversation. So let's say she's been conflicted um, you know, for months. Let's say she, three months she's been on the fence about having this conversation, having to broach it with her family. So for three months, she has been carrying around this weight, this guilt, this anxiety about having to tell someone no and avoiding the conversation for three months because you're afraid to have it. And so that anxiety follows you for three months. So with conflict resolution, the technique or the, you know, the skill that you work on is being able to rip off the bandage, is being able to say the hard stuff and say what needs to be said quickly so that you get to the other side of the hard part. So now if we've needed to have this conversation for three months, then we finally have it, that puts the anxiety to bed. Because now you're moving to a proactive state instead of a reactive state. Stay in this, this state of how I'm gonna react and how they're gonna react instead of what am I doing to actively address this conflict, being proactive. And actually having the conversation, actually throwing it out there, what needs to be said, advances you just that quickly to the proactive state and tackling the conflict head on. So people in situations like this, when you are having a hard time broaching a conversation, think about it like that. The sooner I have this conversation, the sooner I'm over the hump versus dodging it, running from it and carrying the, that anxiety with me every day. Okay. So of course, you know, there's also the decision of why she may have decided not to do this in the first place, but to not have that kind of background, that's the advice that I'm gonna give. It's an oversimplification, but if you start from a place of how does this benefit me? What do I really want? And what decision should I make so that, so that my needs are met and I am fulfilled? And then just plan to have the difficult conversation as quickly as possible, all right? That's actively addressing the conflict, which we've talked about in previous episodes. So good luck, Torn. Please share a follow-up if you're willing. I know the audience would love to hear how this turns out. We can see from past episodes, we get invested in these questions, don't we? <laughs> we like to hear how they turn out. So if you ever share an MC Q&A and I share it on the show, please write back in and give us an update on how things turned out, all right? Okay, let's take another question. Question number two came by email and goes by new MC, which I love. Listen, people, if you want to make me smile, just refer to yourself as an MC. I love, love, love hearing people use my MC. It just makes me smile. So yes, yeah, so my new MC asks, I have a question. I did reporting every month when I was working. Now that I'm retired, I hardly do any public speaking. When we moved to our retirement community, I started pickleball. At the yearly dinners, I had to speak. That didn't bother me much because I knew the majority of the audience. 
When I started Sports and Games, which is a competition similar to the Olympics, I was dealing with the entire community. I had to speak at the opening and closing ceremony, which made me very uncomfortable. A lot of homeowners were former teachers, doctors, nurses, very professional people. I did rehearse. I recorded myself. I wrote talking points on index cards so I wouldn't memorize what I wanted to say. And here's the question. How can I not sound rehearsed and more like talking to a friend? The outcome was I was very nervous and I didn't say everything that was on the index cards. All right, new MC, I love the amount of preparation you put into emceeing your opening and closing ceremonies. It sounds like you already do a lot of the things that I recommend. You know, you rehearsed in advance, you wrote notes on index cards. So the question here is, how can you not sound rehearsed? All right, but I actually hear another concern and that's that you missed some of your talking points. So first I wanna ask, do you actually sound rehearsed, right? I say that because sometimes we think we did worse than we actually did. So have you played back the actual recording of the speech? You know, do you have a recording from delivery day? <laughs> delivery day, that's what I used to, um, I used to call it D-Day with my students. That was, that was deadline day, that was the day of the speech. So on delivery day, do you have that recording and can you compare it to the recordings of your practices since you were recording those, because that's what's gonna help you self-correct. So the main thing that we do that makes a speaking opportunity sound more rehearsed and less like a conversation is that we talk like a robot. That's It's that very robotic sound, a lot of, um, a very monotone voice, all right? So were you doing that? Because the vocal variety is what makes a huge difference. I always tell people, to you know, record yourself telling a story or record yourself while you're having a conversation you know, with permission, of course, with the person that you're having a conversation with. These days we do, you know what? This is perfect. On your next Zoom call or schedule a casual Zoom call with a friend and record that Zoom call. So play back the video and watch yourself because when you have a conversation, a natural conversation, with a friend, you'll hear a cadence in, in your voice. But, you know, you guys have been listening to me for a few weeks now. You probably hear a rhythm, a kind of cadence in my voice. So we, we all have that. So listen to yours. Find, listen and find your rhythm, your cadence. You know, when you speak, do you jump around from, from one thought to another? Do you flow naturally from one point to the next? Are your conversations easy to follow? Or do you typically kind of jump around? Do you add a little humor? Do you um, you know, have a little, have a few sidebars in your conversation and then circle back to your point. So think about all the things that are unique to the way that you tell a story and the way you have a conversation and then imitate that. All right. When you observe it, imitate it. It sounds crazy, but that's really how to perfect this sound of, you know, not sounding rehearsed is by doing the things that you naturally do when you know, you aren't rehearsing, if you will, when it's a, a, a natural conversation, a natural flow in the conversation. So that is what I teach people to do in my coaching. I actually teach you to imitate and impersonate <laughs> your, your conversational speaking voice. Okay. So to that point, improving the actual sound of your voice, like I mentioned earlier, when sometimes we sound like a robot, we have that very monotone voice. Fixing that is a lot more challenging than just not sounding rehearsed, right? Because that's something that, you know, that actually takes working out over a series of coaching sessions. So my technique for that is rooted in impersonation as well. It's your, your, your matching tones. I'm going to, you know, point out tones in that vocal variety and then have you match different tones. So it's a lot like how actors learn, you know, the way that they learn to impersonate and imitate characters as they prepare for a role. So I'd have you do some role playing. I'd have you do some imitation of accents and um, imitations of tones and different pitches to add some vocal variety to your natural speaking voice. And then the more you do that, the more inherent it becomes. It becomes, you know, a part of you eventually. And then you'll, you'll hear that vocal variety in your voice. Okay. But missing your talking points Circling back to that part, 
um, that's actually common. And that doesn't determine whether a speaking opportunity was successful or not. It is okay if you miss a point. We hate to miss a point because, you know, we spend so much time crafting this speech, crafting our script, what it is we want to say. And those points are so important to us. But honestly, your audience has no idea. Your audience doesn't know what you drafted. So if you forget to include something, they won't notice. And more than likely, the reason why you even forgot it is because you replaced it with some content that was really just as relevant, you know, really just as necessary for the conversation. So your audience doesn't feel slighted, right? So as long as your speech still makes sense in the end, if it still successfully, you know, informed us or entertained us and it met our expectations, you know, with regard to time and what you promised to talk about, it's still successful. So rather than write down the actual sentences or um, writing down a full sentence that includes the data on your card, instead, write down the, the actual verbal cue, you know, a word that you use as a clue to what you want to say, and then memorize that content, the content that's related to that cue. Because the signpost acts as um, kind of like a like a if then rule, you know, if I say this, then I say this, right? If I say this, remember to talk about this. So when you look down quickly and you see that bullet point that says data, then when you look down and you see the word data as a verbal cue, as a signpost, then you'll say, oh yes, that's where I'm supposed to give this statistic. Okay, so you see how that works? So that way you're not looking down so often because you need to see a full script, a full sentence of data. Because if you're on a roll, you're gonna, you, you will easily forget to do that. If the conversation is going well, if the speaking opportunity is going well, then you feel that you aren't relying on the card. So you don't look down to the card. And if you don't look down, then you aren't going to see that line of text that you were supposed to include, right? But if you find yourself, because you haven't scripted it, if you find yourself needing to fetch for some information and then you have to look down on your card to see what it was, then you're going to see that verbal cue, that signpost quickly and easily. And then you'll say, oh, yes, that's right. I needed to talk about this data. Does that make sense? OK, so keep the information simple. Just have a, a handful of key data or statistics memorized so that it's easy enough to recall when you see that signpost. OK. So these were great questions. And like I said, it's a good flow for now finishing up the episode with this LinkedIn audit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to include some timestamps because like I said, it's a lot of information today. So I'm going to include some timestamps in the episode notes that point you to question one, point you to question two, and where to dive right into the LinkedIn audit if you need to go back and pick it up later in the day. You know, I know we listen to episodes a little differently. Sometimes we don't listen to one full episode at once. You know, we're driving in our cars, we're on the treadmill, we're on our, uh, our spin bike, you know, grocery shopping. So maybe you, you dive into half of the episode and then you pick up on the other half later. So I'm going to give you some timestamps to help you with that. All right. But we are going to close out with a great discussion, a great overview of what it looks like to kind of overhaul your LinkedIn profile. It's what I call a LinkedIn audit or LinkedIn optimization, you know, using LinkedIn to its optimal potential, right? And then taking a look at what you're doing on LinkedIn right now and where you can make some enhancements. So I had a good conversation with a client named Wendy who had been unemployed for about six months and lucked up and got another opportunity. But now that she's experienced some long-term unemployment, very unexpectedly, Wendy wants to stay ready, fine-tuning her LinkedIn profile and having that ready so she doesn't have to get ready if she's ever laid off again. She's in the contracting world and we know how that goes. There's a lot of layoffs and they typically happen to contractors first, unfortunately. And with the recession, you know, kind of here, you know, we're we're in this stage now where 
um, it looks like a recession and feels like a recession, but they're telling us it's not a full recession. But just to be ready. So you'll hear in this conversation that Wendy is already thinking about the next eight to 10 years, looking ahead the next eight to 10 years for when she's ready for retirement and setting up her LinkedIn profile in a way that speaks to the work that she wants to do in the next decade, building out her network that way, starting to add connections that might, that might support her next chapter, but also populating her profile with the information that she needs to showcase her skill set and her interest and her brand right now. So she's going to start building her network of people that support the work she does today and the work that she wants to do in the future. So it's a great conversation and a good way to wrap up everything that we've been talking about for the past few weeks. My It's Me approach, using the It's Me approach to populate things like your resume, your LinkedIn profile, applying it to the traditional job hunt and applying it to entrepreneurship, to your brand story, to selling yourself. So as we move on to more conversations about how confidence and change presents themselves in relationships and beyond, this is a good way to close out that discussion. All right. So enjoy this conversation with Wendy as we do her LinkedIn audit. How long were you unemployed before uh -huh. this new opportunity? Six months. Six months. Six months. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's a long time. And um, this job is a career pivot, actually. It's not in the same career field that I've been in um, all these years. So it's kind okay. of different. Same but different. Um, you know, same kind of structure, but it's a, a lot of different things that I have to catch myself up to, I should say. Okay. So tell um, me about so that. Tell me where you were and what you're doing now. So I was doing logistics for federal contracts um, and uh, the intelligence community and is in the DOD um, arenas. And so um, I had started out, um, came from a government background, decided I wanted to go into the contractor field um, to be okay. able to uh, learn something different, do something different. I wasn't really um, happy, I guess I should say, with the way the path my career was going at the time. I didn't even feel like I had a career, to be honest with you. I felt like I had a job. I didn't couldn't learn anything, couldn't really, didn't have a voice in anything, wasn't really, no processes, no procedures. It was really just tough. And so I made that change and I went into um, contractor field and, you know, they said, oh, you're going to work in asset management. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go into the financial world. <laughs> no, I didn't. I was definitely into logistics and to tracking assets and things along those lines. But um, I worked there for a few years, was able to get myself into a space where I did become the expert, I did start to, because we were ba basically building everything from the ground up. So it was being able to be in the right place at the right time, knowing where I was going to be, how I was going to move forward, things along those lines, and, and being part of a team that was helping establish all of that and learning from the industry, which at that time really didn't have too much of a structure for asset management as that was back in the early 2000s when computers were just, you know, really getting to be on everybody's desk. And okay. I moved on to do that same type of thing internationally, um, but then I got laid off. And so now I'm into a systems engineering type of position where I uh, have to learn about the, the, you know, purchase the equipment. I've bought the equipment. I know what that does, but now I'm learning into a different aspect of it and how it's going to fit into the environment and um, just being able to walk into something new that I haven't ever really been into before. And you know, not the same people. People don't know me. I don't have that reputation that I had in my previous positions where okay. people are like, oh, yeah, what, you know, you know, Wendy, okay, you know, she'll ask, ask her. And so now it's, uh, it's kind of stepping myself back down, which yeah. it's not a step down. It's more of just um, feeling like a you know, fish that, out of water. Kind of yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So I know that, um, you know, you found me through POAC, through um, Maryland mm -hmm. Department of Labor, and they are always talking about the LinkedIn profile. And yes. Yes. So is that, is that who was in your ear to? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> part of it. it um, um, part of it was just job search. Everybody's like, go to LinkedIn, go to LinkedIn, go to LinkedIn. You know, so um, you know, just see who's who you know out there and who you can you know connect with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it, the funny, the funny aspect of this job that I'm, you know, when I got hired for this with this new company. I, it wasn't so much that they, they said, oh, yeah, we'll hire you on, but we need to find you a spot. 
And when they, you know, put my resume out to different people, I had an interview with um, this, this man and he said, I don't know if you remember me. He said, I worked with you years ago. And he said, and you would be absolutely perfect for this job. And I, you know, I remembered his name and I was just like, I, he goes, no, he goes, I worked in the same company you did. I was working at this team. And he goes, and you, he said, you have the exact skills that I need for this position. And I was oh, just wow. like, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, so I, yeah, you really don't know who you know, who, you, who remembers you basically. Absolutely. Absolutely. That network is everything and not burning mm-hmm. bridges. I see right. you, you um, had good performance there. He remembered you, remembered your skill set. And when the opportunity presented, presented itself, here you are. You're right. right. Yeah. That's excellent. All right. I'm pulling up your profile. That's a great picture. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So 71 connections. Uh, let's take a look at your about section. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So this area here, you've probably seen on other people's profiles that uh, people are using using LinkedIn covers more now to um, include more contact information that's list that might not be listed on the actual page. And it's one of the signs that you are active and you kind of know (laughs) what LinkedIn and the LinkedIn community expects of you is to have that populated. If you are new to LinkedIn, people will know by you not having that cover. Well, I I screamed it right there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. And it'll be brand specific, you know, because you're in the tech space, it sounds like um, that you will, you'll be able to um, they have lots of different designs that, you know, kind of scream technology or, or project based. Your about section is pretty good. Um, do you remember my workshop where we talked about the it's me approach? Yes. Okay. So this is, is exactly the area that I was talking about on LinkedIn, where you have the opportunity to um, include that brand story and really give people some inti- insight into your personality and your in- interests. It doesn't have to be right now. You have about three paragraphs. Um, it can be more creative. It can have a lot more flair. It doesn't have to be as formal and structured as we think it would be. I think the first thing we do is try to write it like we would the summary of our mm-hmm. resume, right? Right. But there's more of an opportunity to engage people and connect when you tell a little bit more about yourself and people get to really know the real you and not just what we would see in black and white on the resume. So this is where I pick back up the conversation where we left off with the it's me approach and write out that brand story and see how much we can, how, how much we can use that to populate this about section. Okay. Did you do that exercise alongside, you know, the participants as we did it that day to think about something from your past that's brought you to present day. Um, did you start to write that out at all? Draft any bullet I, points? I did, and the notebook's downstairs. <laughs> so, but yes, I did. Okay. So um, in, honest, in, in all fairness and honesty, that's one of my goals, I'm going on vacation in, uh, to, uh, no, next week, the 12th, was okay. I'm going to work on my profile while you know, the family's doing something different, you know? <laughs> okay, okay. Being was there anything about the work you were, the work you were doing then that you feel supports the work that you do now or has made you, you know, a more well-rounded professional or has given you some insight or a different type of appreciation for the work that you do now? Anything from your past that you can use to, to pull us to present day? I was a mentor and I don't have that listed here. Okay. But I mentored about, 10 to 12 different employees on a formal basis not even just not even so much on an informal basis that was probably a couple hundred you know that would just happen wow. to pop it when I come into my office or talk or you know just needed some kind of you know this is through the years but I did have a formal mentoring program and that does help you see a lot of different perspectives and that could because in a mentoring program it's not you you're getting mentored as well because you're learning somebody else that's maybe Absolutely. the same as you completely different mm-hmm. as you so mm-hmm. it was a good experience there as well okay 
And that was that voluntary? Was that um, part of, was it an, an ask that, you know, it was alongside or within your job description or was it um, something that, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. It was a voluntary. They, like, they said, we're going to start this mentoring program. Who would like to mentor? I mean, it was in, within my job, but it was okay. not, it's anything that was a job duty. It's just mm -hmm. something that, you know, senior, you know, managers, senior managers would sign up to do. Okay. Well, there is a projects section. Um, and I don't know that it would have to even have to go into the projects section. So I need to okay. add more into my experience section, you're saying? Yeah. So when you um, go back into this area and you have this bar over here that allows you to edit. So maybe okay. I'll go to my profile and I can show you. But typically, once you go into edit and you can and you add more detail for every entry, there's also an area for projects and it will allow you to list projects. I would probably give it more visibility than including it as a project within this, um, you know, within this role. I would probably give it its own entry. So okay. under the experience section, make it another entry and the dates can be simultaneous, that, that's perfectly fine. And then you can just list in the title, volunteer mentoring program or, project lead and then the name of that mentoring program something like that so that okay. you can establish yourself as the lead as the head of um of the program list all that same experience the same way that you would the actual job entry but it will it, it will showcase that experience you can give as much detail about it as you would the actual you know full-time opportunity and people can see those see that experience side by side Okay. Yeah, I would definitely do that. Especially since you can quantify it. You know, when people want to see those results, you can you can provide those types of stats. You know, how many people you mentored. You might be able to share uh, the outcomes of some of the people that you mentored. You know, okay. I would I would definitely showcase that. Okay. Okay. So it looks like you're doing the right thing. You've already start to populate these areas you're just just really getting started right now are these companies that you are interested in um, that you would like to work for them tell me about why you follow them uh, national security agency is my customer um, okay. general dynamics and uh, gdit was a previous company um, it was well, yeah, just to just say, because it was bought out, bought out. Now that's the, the end result of it. Okay. I don't even know what LHH, I may have, it may have been somebody that popped up and I probably didn't know it. I'll be honest okay. with you. Um, so the, the, the companies and the influencers you follow are an extension of yourself, really. Like okay. when people scroll down and they see what you're interested in, that's helping them get to know Wendy. So that interest area should represent you as well. So as you look through this and you say, I don't know why I follow them. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's what other people will think as well. You know. So I would pay a little bit more attention to that. People are um, looking at all of your activity on LinkedIn across the board, including what you like. Okay. You know, when they show show all activity here. So have you, I don't know if you've paid much attention to this. Um, so this comment right here, yep, all is well. And I hope the same with you, Carl. So imagine if that was a longer and broader conversation and you started to mention personal things. How was your weekend? Or, you know, you mentioned family members' names or team members' names or any of that. All of that gets captured in your okay. comments. So as you think about it, your activity, from now on, think about what you want to showcase. What comments you want people to see to support, you know, your professional brand. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. And it's great. I was just thinking it's great that I'm seeing it. What I'm seeing what you're seeing versus what I see. Yeah. You know, so that's, this is great. Yeah. So let's see, show all activity. I like your stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I won't complain about that.
Okay. Well, none of this is off brand, I would say. Especially since these are some of the companies that you follow. All right, and there's your job announcement. All right, so you are posting and it's good to see that you're actually active on LinkedIn, but none of this really says much about Wendy. Okay. About the work that you wanna do, about um, existing programs that you might be interested in, things that other companies are doing that you applaud. So the types of posts that you want to start doing might might say that might speak to that okay if you are uh, it sounds like you are an advocate for mentoring you you believe in the benefits of mentoring maybe you follow what other companies are doing in the way of mentoring programs okay maybe once you see them you comment on what it is about that program that you like what it is that you would do if you were uh, heading that program, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, what you would like to see. Okay. Applauding, you know, shouting someone out. Um, great work, so-and-so on the work that you're doing, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Right. No, no, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Let me go back to, do you share any, any other posts? I haven't seen that so far, but are you opposed to it? I'm not opposed article? to it. Okay. No, I, I'm definitely, I would, I would like to, it's just time right now is just, um, but no, I can do, definitely do more of that. Um, yeah. I think, so I, I think the first thing I need to do is broaden my network to see more things as well. You know, what other people are doing. Okay. Too, I would think. Um, okay. But you can always, that, that doesn't have to happen just with your connections, establishing, building out your connections is something you can do alongside being active on LinkedIn. Are you active on social media at all? Um, um, yeah, for, I have Facebook. Uh, I have Instagram. Okay. Um, what else do I have? I have um, Snapchat. I don't use Instagram and Snapchat, honestly. And Facebook, I haven't been on there, you know, just randomly. I'll be on there. It's okay. more for connect with family. Okay. It's the, it's the same idea, though. I think for, um, I would say it's safer almost to fetch information. You know, you find the articles outside of LinkedIn, perhaps the, the, the podcast that you listen to or any articles that you read, um, find those and then share them. Okay. Because then that's an opportunity for you to, you know, you, you know that it's going to represent your your thoughts and interests because you've actually sought it yourself. And then to share it, you can then include some type of commentary um, that showcases Wendy's interests, that showcase how Wendy feels about this article, why she's sharing it within her LinkedIn network. Okay. And then from there, the connections that you do have might engage, but if not, there that's still establishing you are still you know getting active on LinkedIn, and then you'll start posting consistently because typically we start our days the same way, right? We might look at a few articles, we might um, look through our timelines on our the social media platforms that we are on, and be inspired by something, and maybe we'll share it or maybe we won't. But um, you can dedicate a part of your morning to finding that type of content, that type of shareable content and sharing on LinkedIn. Okay. And just thinking about what it is you wanna say, what it is you wanna reveal about Wendy, your professional ethic, um, the things that you're into. Maybe, maybe you get to highlight um, a skill set in some way with, with the comments that you make on, on another post. So it doesn't have to start from your, your own feed, you know, what people in your network are talking about. You can actually go and seek information and then post it to your profile. Okay. 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 But I'm glad that you do want to build your network because that's what LinkedIn is all about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so 
how, what's your plan for that? Oh, I, I guess I'll, you know, as I'm seeing, you know, I do get the notifications that, oh, this person has, you know, expanded their network and has so many new connections. Um, and then. So, um, yeah, so I, there's a couple of ways you can go about building your network. Of course, what the, the easiest thing that we usually don't even think to do is just sit still and think about the people in your department mm -hmm. or previous departments and then connect with those people first. So look, you know, where you are currently, but then think about past employers and people that you've lost touch with. So it's as simple as putting in their names and of course, you know, whether they show up in the profile or not. And then if you still remember the um, email addresses, then you yeah. can easily type in their email address because sometimes it does ask how you know each other. Um, I don't think it requests, now that I think about it, I, I have the, the premium which allows me to just connect with anyone and um, send them a message to, you know, kind of jog their memory of, of how we know each other, how we're connected, or if we have mutual friends or connections. Right. Um, but I don't think that's, I don't think that's the case. I think that it allows you to say, um, it'll ask you how you know one another, and it might say previous employer or current employer or other or something like that. But I think it's much easier now to connect with people, even without having the premium premium account and email access. It, it is definitely a lot more easy, easier than it was yeah. years ago. So yeah, you remember you know. that? You remember when yes. you had to have a physical email address before it would allow you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're dating ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So and then, you know, be consistent. Say you're gonna do that to 10, 20 people a day. Okay. And then build that out. But again, like everything else that we've been talking about, be strategic. You're not you're not trying to make connections just for the sake of, of, of being able to see that number grow. Right. It's really about do these connections support the work that I do now or support the work that I want to do in the future. Good, yeah, good question. And then also it's not about um, just your, it, it sounds to me like you're already thinking eight to 10 years out about what retirement looks like and what I might want to do in retirement. And so my connection should also um, maybe support what I plan to do in the next eight to 10 years. Right. Do I want to mentor again? And if so, who are the people that I need to uh, get buy-in from? Are there any, you know, who in leadership might support that me establishing a mentoring program here? And maybe there's someone that has a program effort that they haven't been able to get off the ground. And you reach out to that person because you feel like you can support it or, you know, help get it off the ground. So. That's a, that's a way to start building out those connections. It's not so much, everything we do on LinkedIn is strategic. Everything should be on brand. So when you're thinking about building out the network, it is actually thinking about the right people and not just building names, not just, <laughs> not, right. not just connecting just for the sake of connecting. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at my profile. Okay. So this is what your page, so you see all these areas here where you have mm -hmm. this pencil and this, this you're, where you're able to you know, go in and edit. Right. So that's how your page looks to you. So, so these are the different areas of your profile that you would see uh, as you go in to edit and improve it. Right. Okay. And maybe I should open up another tab so that I can look at your profile and we can kind of toggle between my profile and yours. Okay, so, and you can see both tabs, right? Mine and mm -hmm. yours? Okay. So this is that cover that I was talking about. You see how I mentioned being able to include more contact information here at yes. a glance, right? And right there in the cover versus having to scroll through the entire profile? Yes. Yeah. And so you would do that on Canva and, and, and not just Canva. That's just what I use and that's what's top of mind. But right. of course, there are plenty of different places that will help, you know, we'll have these templates for you to drop in a cover. 
You can make better use of this headline area. You want it to be eye-catching. You've probably seen the, the variety of ways that people <laughs> talk about themselves in the headline now. Have you seen that just from? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so there are sentences, there are actual taglines, and then there are some that are just still very formal and will just include a job title. And so I think that that should be a reflection of your personality. So what do people know about Wendy? If you were to ask three to six people, what comes to mind when they think of Wendy? Their responses you're going to find <laughs> or should be very telling. Like what, how does, how does Wendy represent? Okay. So then if that's what three to six people see, then chances are that's what everybody sees. And then your page will continue to be an extension of your personality from the things you post to the way that you comment. And of course you don't have to be, you know, absolutely stuck to it, but consistency is everything. So you wanna show up for people on your profile the same way that you would show up in person. And that's what we talk about these days, being your true authentic self. So the, so the Wendy that we see on your LinkedIn profile is who we should, you know, hear when we are riding along in the elevator or, you know, grabbing, grabbing our lunch in the cafeteria and we have a quick conversation. That same tone, that same personality. Okay. Okay. I'm writing notes. I forgot to tell you yeah. that I was doing that. <laughs> so. No, 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 no problem. No problem. So in this section here, this will depend on your options and modes. There's a, a, a general user mode and then there's a creator mode. If you don't use creator mode, you won't really have these options. So okay. let's see how on your profile, there isn't as much information there. There's no area where you, you can showcase that you talk about these specific subjects. Right. But that's how, I, that's how I use this area. So you see, I have um, an area here where I can list the specific topics, things that I talk about. And then I'm consistent with that. Just about every post that you can see, and we'll scroll down to my activity, but they're usually about one of these five things. And that's the maximum. You can list five hashtags. So I have change, diversity, public speaking, entrepreneurship, and confidence building. So when you scroll down and you see my featured posts, so here's one um, about my podcast. And of course, that podcast is about change, diversity, and entrepreneurship, you know, all those things, the things mm -hmm. that I talk about. This is, I have a, a, one of my clients featured here. I have my It's Me approach featured here. So you have the option of choosing from all of the activity that you post and comment on, which of them would you like to have featured at the top of your profile so that if people come to your profile, but don't spend a lot of time there, just kind of scroll through quickly. What are they gonna see right at the top of the profile? So these are these, the, the things that I select to be featured okay. at the top of my profile. And then that moves down to your activity. Okay. So these are my posts from the past week here talking about confidence here i'm talking about the podcast great resignation you know all those things career and entrepreneurship related this is a post about one of the episodes we're talking about career pivots the great reshuffle the great resignation and then this one is about speaking opportunities and um, you know getting comfortable with presenting yourself um, on camera live on you know all the the ways that we present ourselves on social media reels things like that videos right yeah okay and then here's my about section mine is about the same length as yours and it includes a part of my brand story i shared my brand story with you all in the poec workshop if you remember yes and mentioned that the, the about section is a great place to drop you know, some of that content. So when you're constructing your elevator pitch and your brand story, I, I use that, um, that acronym, the COUNT method, create once and use numerous times. 
-hmm. There's no reason why you should be sitting there thinking about what to say on every platform when your professional brand is, you know, represented across all of those platforms. So you can use the same content and that way you're not having to think about what to say anytime you start a new profile it's going to be the same information. So when you sit still for one day and you write, you actually map out that elevator pitch and that brand story using the it's me approach, then it's ready. You can okay. you know cut and paste and populate just about everywhere. Excuse me. Okay. And then the experience. So this is the experience I choose to highlight because it reflects the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm a consultant trainer, moderator, workshop facilitator. I'm an adjunct professor. And yes, I have experience that goes beyond that, but it's not relevant. It's not relevant to the work that I do today. As you can see, I have um, a graphic of the podcast and then you know an explanation. So there is a media option. So when you go back and you round out that experience, um, the three uh, jobs in your employment history that you have on your profile, mm -hmm. When you go to edit those, you'll see that there's an opportunity to add media in the plus sign. Okay. Okay. So I list clients here instead of as separate entries because they aren't um, different jobs per se. They're my different projects and clients within this hit this this history this entry my consulting work right. so i list them all here and then i will add more media to reflect you know what i do at the different uh, for the different clients and so that's where i was saying that for your um for your last job having a mentoring program it is something that you could put in the body of that entry but i think it would be showcased better if you made it a separate entry and then just put in the job title that this was a volunteer okay. you know, role. Because you're thinking about people coming quickly. They aren't going to take their time and comb through your profile. They're going to look very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So if that mentor program is something you want to highlight, I'd say to give it its own entry so it gets the visibility you want to give it. Okay. So again, as I go through your profile, I see that you are populating it the same way that I am. You are just getting started. So yeah. now you want to go back and expand it. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, as we talked about earlier, it's just really thinking of, like you said, yeah, I have to do my, you know, it's me, my, my little elevator speech, my brand, mm -hmm. and, you know, and just finding those things. So I think it is just a it's probably going to be me starting on something and then go, oh, I can add this or I can take this out. I don't, you know, just like you did, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to change that. <laughs> so I have to look at it as a living, breathing document, not just yes. a, um, just sitting there, you know, collecting dust type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Something that I don't touch until I'm job hunting again. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, you should, you should plan how you're going to use it. Okay. So I, I I tell people find their happy medium, and for me LinkedIn is my happy medium. So when we when we say happy medium, we're usually talking about finding some middle ground, right? What right. are these things that I'm going to do, or what are the things that I'm willing to do? So I say when we when it comes to social media, find your happy medium. What's the one <laughs> that you're willing to commit to? Okay. And if you're actively and aggressively job hunting, then that might be LinkedIn, in which case you want to take a pause from the others because the activity that um, the things that you post on places like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, places like that, that shows up in search results. When people go to search your first and last name as an employer, you know, when you've applied and now they're, they're checking you out. All of that shows up. LinkedIn typically shows up first, but then all of the others are right behind it with a preview of maybe the first post, you know, the most recent posts. So the more active you are, the more recent that information is going to be that populates. Okay. So be careful across the board of what you like and what you post because all of that shows up in search results. Right. 
Yeah. So when you're actively and aggressively job hunting, LinkedIn probably becomes your happy medium. I would like to um, make sure I answer any questions that you have before we wrap up. I appreciate all the information. That was great. Good, good. I'm glad you're getting something out of it. I know that one of you said that you prefer to get your coaching in the way of just being someone being available when you need them. So to, <laughs> to, to, to ask questions when you have questions. And I welcome that. You know, like I mentioned, I, I do the podcast. I actually like to use questions that are emailed to me and, um, you know, submitted on Instagram and places like that. I, I like to use them for the podcast as well. So okay. feel free All to right, shoot cool. me some questions. And, and if I answer it, I'll, you know, tag you and, <laughs> and mention okay, you perfect. And you know that, that I answered that question. All right. All right. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Okay. You too. All right. All right. And thanks. So that's going to do it for our episode today in the seas. I hope it was a great conversation. Lots of content for sure, but hopefully you're finding it all valuable. I'm giving you everything you need in one episode today. I'm also going to help you by giving you some timestamps in the episode notes so that you can jump right to the MC Q&A or you can jump right into the second half of the show and get the LinkedIn audit. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at It's Marcia Cork. You'll get additional tips and some commentary, including my weekly series, You're Doing It Wrong. And of course, you'll get Mama Gar's Monday Motivation. Keep those questions coming so we can use them for the MC Q&A. You can send those by email to marcia at marciacork.com or you can DM me on Instagram at it's Marcia Cork. You can also go to the episode notes find that option to record your question and submit an electronic question as well. See you next time, MCs. Bye-bye.